Hello, and welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Stacey Wilson Hunt. Before we are joined today by our guests, I wanted to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the last year, the foundation has given over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a SAG After artist and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you so much for your support. And now it's my pleasure to introduce six amazing performers from HBO and HBO Max original Emmy eligible series. Noma Domenzwini from The Undoing and Made for Love, Hannah Einbinder from Hacks, Zasha Mamet from The Flight Attendant, Kristen Miliotti from Made for Love, Julianne Nicholson from Mayor of Easttown, and Maruche Opia from I May Destroy You. So I would love to ask all of you to reflect on the following, which is what was your most formative moment as an artist whether that be as you came of age as a young person or a big break job that really made you see this as a viable way to make a living. So maybe I'll start with Julianne. Um, you had me up until viable way to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold up, hold up. Um, viable doesn't mean lucrative though, by the way. Yeah, okay, well. <laughs> um, so I, I had a moment where I had gone to a couple of different acting classes because I thought I wanted to be an actress for many, many years and none of them made sense to me. None of them felt good to me. And I went to one class with a teacher named Sheila Gray in New York. And the first day I was there, she put a chair across from me and had me put my mother in that chair. And that was what the exercise was. And it all suddenly made sense to me of how mm. I wanted to approach it. So in terms of that approach versus other classes, the emotional aspect of, of allowing stuff, yourself to open up like that? Bringing stuff from my own life and bringing the specificity of that to a role hmm. felt good to me. I like that. Making it relatable to your own experience. Yeah. Hmm. How about you, Kristen? I'm, I also got tripped up because I was like, well, is it the first time that I was like, oh, I think I can do this for a living? Or is it like the first time that I realized that I like wanted to do this? Maybe? Either, either one, either one that felt the most impactful to you that sort of still sticks with you as an important experience. I don't know why this is coming up because I don't think at this age I knew I wanted to be an actor at all. And this is like a very like stereotypical, I went to a summer camp, mm -hmm. did like a musical called Leader of the Pack, which is very stupid. It's like, <laughs> it's about like greasers. Yeah, the, the song from the 60s. Yeah, yeah. and I auditioned for like all the girls in it. And they were like, I didn't get it. But they were like, you can be this one girl, you can be nerd girl who like, f who comes out and screams and faints. And I came <laughs> for a performance and fell down a staircase by accident. And, oh, then, no. and then like judged it and everyone laughed. And I remember being like, I like I like I love like I just immediately like oh I like that. <laughs> and how um, old were you, Kristen? Eleven. Wow. Something okay. like that. And but I remember like the thrill of getting to um, turn a mistake into a like choice or something like the, mm. the like it was like a, an immediate flow with the people with all the campers. I just remember like a little thing in the back of my head going like ding. Like, I, like I love that. I like it. And that's really interesting too, because I feel like you t you've infused a lot of that into your work. You're very oh, physical. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I love that. And how about you, Zasha? Oh man. Um, I, you know, I, I don't remember ever wanting to do anything else. I had <laughs> the, I had the blessing and the curse of growing up in a show business family, like all the way back to my grandparents. So I always say it was sort of like going into the, sh like if my parents like made shoes, like if I'd gone into the factory business, like mm -hmm. if I'd wanted to be a dentist, they would have been like, that's really weird. Um, <laughs> but I remember, um, I remember being very young. It was, um, I moved to LA when I was five. So it was before that. So I must've been like four 
And I have this memory. My, my mom used to throw dinner parties and I would like sneak downstairs and hide under the piano and listen to everybody talking Hmm. at the dinner table. And I remember, I don't know why this memory is so vivid, but I remember everybody one night discussing how they all had to get home because they had to wake up the next morning to go to work. And they were all like, begrudgingly talking about their jobs and just Hmm. how like um, sort of like mundane and boring they were. And they were like, but you know, got to make a living. And I remember even that young thinking about what I would be excited and willing to wake up for at any time, day or night, Mm -hmm. and like be willing to do that for the rest of my life. And, and Mm -hmm. this was the only thing that came to mind. And that just like, continued to be the only thing that came to mind as I got older. And like, Hmm. I, I, I don't know, I hold on to that a lot. Cause like, as we all know this, I think there's this deep misconception that this job is super glamorous, which it isn't at all. And, you know, we're like in the cold, underdressed, getting wet, waking Hmm. up at 3am and working 18 (laughs) hours. And any time that I'm like, Oh my God, I'm just like, it beats working. Like that's what, and I just remind myself of like my little four-year-old self being like, this is what you wanted. And like, you know, I also, anybody who wants to do this, I'm like, if you can do anything else and be happy, do that instead. Because like, this is just so hard. Um, hard. But you know, I think, I think it's that thing. It's like, it exists in some of us and there's just nothing else that is going to make you want to wake up at three in the morning. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think it's true. We, we saw our parents and older generations in our families kind of that struggle with that. I have to go to work that yeah. dread of going to work. And I felt uncomfortable with that too. And so you realize you do have a choice, right? It's a yeah. hard choice, but it is a choice. And I think it's, it's brave that you made that choice. So thank you. <laughs> and how about you, Noma? You've had an amazing ride, a very non-traditional entree to the business. What was your early, early uh, epiphany, I guess? Well, that thing of which in the question that you ask, I, and it keeps coming up and I'm thinking about it. It's a moment that I didn't do drama school because I didn't get into drama school two years mm-hmm. running. Then I found this workshop, which was uh, run by this guy, Tony, who was going to teach you to do monologues in front of an audience of um, casting agents, uh, casting directors, agents, um, people in the industry. That thing you go, yes, let me get into that way. I remember we worked on the piece and Jump, so many things within that. But it, what I loved about Tony, he said, I want you to try and make me laugh in this because it was a very serious piece mm-hmm. by George Sewell from the Coloured Museum, a girl who lays eggs as her babies and you realise there's a lot of darkness within that. So I came in doing, oh, I will make you feel something. I'm just going to cry <laughs> all the way. I remember him looking at me going, hmm, okay. So could you try and make me laugh next time you do it? I am like, I'll, I'll, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> Gave me some notes and we'll work through it. And I, oh, okay, I got it. Okay, let's, let's see that. Then we do the real thing. And we got two nights to do it. And all I remember that, about that very first night was I started and then I woke up and people were standing. And I was oh. like, <gasps> what just happened? And I knew I was in it and it was fantastic. And I, yes, this is it. This is it. And people were so lovely. Jump cut to the next night. Oh, God, I still get shivers about this. Mm. I, I was wide awake. I was wide awake for every moment and every moment didn't work because I was still chasing the performance from the night before. Within the oh. first few minutes, I was like, but I, I'm sure I had it, I had it. Meaning I bombed horrifically that next night. I do remember oh. seeing you there from the first night before being there and kind of going, <laughs> uh, kind of, but what's interesting for me that was that was the moment I went okay this is what this is this is what it is mm-hmm. and it is that chasing that feeling of the first moment and I'm still struggling with that but I mean I don't hold that second performance it's a humbling it's a humbling place mm-hmm. but in that place I went I want to keep going I want to keep seeing if I can get to that place of being in it we're still working on that ball game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that though. But the toggling between victory and defeat, it's just constant, right? And I think that's for, for, yes. for all artists, it's knowing you can do it and then failing and then knowing you can do it. And it's just- And getting it out of this place and getting yeah. out of this place, which was oh. extraordinary. And I just, yeah, there are days and mornings you, and other days you go, yes, and then no. 
Yeah. I love that. That's a great story. Thank you. And how about you, Hannah? What are you thinking of right now? Um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of that, what you're, what you're talking about, kind of like bouncing back from little failures, but I, I, I feel like, you know, I mean, I'm like, not a, I'm like a fucking clown. I'm a stand up. <laughs> Media. So I, my my moments are different. Also, can I curse? Ah, sorry. you can do it. Well, too late. Too late uh, now, my friend. Okay. Damn. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I I mean, um, I did. I joined the improv team in college, and um, I had a lot of trouble improvising because I was. Um, I had a lot of trouble uh, just saying whatever. I'm like way too in my head, and um, a great comedian. Uh, named Nicole Byer, who I love. Love Nicole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she mm -hmm. she played my college, and she asked if anyone from the improv team wanted to open for her and try stand up. And I volunteered, and you know, worked out a set, and you know, had time to write the material myself. And that was such an uh, it, it changed my life because I realized, like, oh yeah, I can do comedy and take my time and be thoughtful and intentional. Mm with a piece of work, which I think is very similar to acting, you know, mm -hmm. um, for sure. But that, that um, it was really eye-opening because I liked comedy, but I, I was not uh, emotionally or mentally able to, to improvise at the time because I was so limited by, you know, being self-critical. Um, mm -hmm. So, which is perfect for stand-up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mean the self-loathing part of it? Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, Oh, yeah. That's great. And that is so, I marvel at, at people who can do improv. I, I feel like it's a magical, I can't even, I can't conceive of acting at all, let alone just extemporaneously being funny. I mean, I think it is truly a, a, a gift. So yeah. to whoever can do it, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And finally, Ruche, I'm sure you have a wonderful story to share from your journey. Um, I... I think what made me realize that this is actually a real thing, it was quite magical. I was about eight or nine and I somehow was able to watch um, What's Love Got To Do With It, mm. the Tina Turner story. And yes. I remember vividly a lot of scenes in it. And I think after that, there was like this children's party and my mom was like, who do you want to go as? My brother was Aladdin, my sister was Pocahontas. And I was like, Tina Turner. And then, <laughs> Love it. and then I think I saw a picture of Angela Bassett and I said to my mom, oh, Tina Turner's amazing. And she was like, that's not Tina Turner. That's the woman who played her. And it took me a long time to realize that that was not her, but that was Angela Bassett playing Tina Turner. And I thought that was so magical wow. that somebody was able to portray somebody else to that level of authenticity Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, when I remember the magic of it, thinking that's something that I want to do. That's an incredible skill. And that was when I realized that, yeah, this was something I wanted in my life. Angela Bassett had it. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is such a great story. I love that. And she was so magical in that in that role. You're right. So just, magical. just visceral. It just if Tina herself couldn't play Tina, she was the next best thing for sure. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing those stories. And it gives us not only great entry points to, to each of you, but also just the wide spectrum of experiences in this very, very difficult career. And I'd love to talk about your shows now, which are all so spectacular in their own special ways. And Noma, you are in The Undoing and Made for Love. So very greedy of you that you were in two of, two of these programs. So well done. <laughs> you, it's interesting looking at your work. You seem to delight in subverting tropes and expectations. Now you can read a part like the attorney role in The Undoing. And on the paper, David E. Kelly is a great writer, but he's written a lot of lawyers, let's face it. But this part could have been, you know, kind of any part, anybody could have played it, but you have brought something so unique to it, a wry sensibility and sort of stealing the show <laughs> in a lot of ways. <gasps> to, to, no, really, truly, because this, that show was so difficult and dark. And, and finally, in whenever episode you popped up, like three or so, I can't recall. Yeah. But finally, we're like, oh, okay, we can breathe. This woman is allowing us to like take this in a little bit. So I'd love to know when you're working with David and Suzanne Beer and bringing this woman to life, how much of yourself were you bringing to this, but also adding to what was on the page? Because I find it to be, it was a very clever invention. 
What's, what was a clever invention? No, I, just, the, just how you brought her to life, I have a feeling was, was sort of cleverly concocted. I have to say, Stacey, that I, when The Undoing came out and listening and watching to people's reactions of it and of Hayley, I was like, wow, okay, they saw that. I had no idea what they were yeah. seeing. In my head, we'll, we'll go back to the actor going, all right, this is what David E. Kelly has written. This is what Susanna Beer would like to get to. This is what seeing the costume designer is wanting to put Haley in. Um, I've got an amazing dialect coach, um, Jerome Butler. Let's see which accent we're going to do, because, of course, there's this English right. accent, and I get the part. And, and like you say, it, anybody could have played that. I, I was lucky enough to get to play Haley, And so I start off with myself and it's Noma, I go, instantly I go, that name Hayley Fitzgerald, is it a black name? It's not an instant black name, but what does that mean? What does that mean? So there's already a history within why is that particular name there for this woman who looks like me? So right. you're going, for my work inside, kind of going, well, how do I picture myself? But I am cheap. I do need costume. I do need, <laughs> I do need all those conversations around mm -hmm. what a party is going to be and then the most important thing is what would the director like and who are the actors I'm working with and that sense of listening and playing and I think for me it got uh, I, I, I got comfortable after three weeks in I was so nervous the first two three days that I was doing it how did you get over those nerves was oh. it was it really hard I mean a drink at night was very <laughs> 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 because, I mean, this story, I'm, and I do talk about, th th this is my story in this moment, is that I'm a theatre creature who got to work with Hugh Grant and Nicole Kidman and Susanna Beer yeah. and Donald Sutherland, and I'm going, right. fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot, that's a so, lot. It's a lot, but there's also a point when my ego goes, well, okay, I've been given the gig, now step into it. And it was... It was Susanna. I, re I remember my mentor, Tony, who I did that piece with um, uh, years ago. He said to me after we'd finished, or I'd said, I'd finished it, said, whose performance was that? Was that yours or was that Susanna's? Because I was talking about the process with him. And I'd say, I'd say that was Susanna's because she made me go quiet. She made me go still. And after doing three years of theatre, I'm like, I know what to I've got to go. Um, and that was my learning curve. So meeting Haley was all those different things. My mind was fizzing because it, it was film. It, it's, it's film and it's this small thing, but actually watching, I am, I, I, I'm one of those when I'm working with other actors, this is when I know they're brilliant because I stop doing, I don't do this all the time by the way, but I love those moments when I go, look at what they're doing. <laughs> Oh shit, it's my line. Cool. <laughs> but you can't help but do that right. with Cole and Hugh. When those are the people I was working with all the time. So I'm kind of going a long way around to say, I couldn't do it on my own this moment. I was right. given this opportunity to play Haley, And within that standing, understanding what David had written in the script, going, where has she come from to be in this business, in this particular law practice? Because, hmm. and I keep going on about it, but she's expensive. Right, she's, she's very expensive. <laughs> and what is that for? So I also knew there's also that thing so cheap, and it is my theatre training, that you're going to see me first on episode three, but we'd already done some other scenes later on. So I was working towards and knowing that what scene had got me in. And it's literally, I knew it was just going to be a walk towards Grace Fraser, Nicole. And all I just said to myself, come on. Enjoy that. Just be in this place. In this place. This is what we do. This is what we do. Who am I? Who am I? You are Haley right now. So really hit Haley for this moment. And then I was able to hold on to that for all the other stuff that I did because hmm. I was working out that stuff. Long way of saying I have no idea. You do. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do have some idea, and that was actually very well said. So <laughs> thank you. And I would love to talk to Hannah next. And congratulations on the show. I mean, I really can't imagine how it feels yes. to have a first series regular gig turn into probably the most talked about comedy right now that anyone is has any attention for. So really, probably it's very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> and now we see how you cope with the attention because you, you know, deflect with humor. So we're, this is all <laughs> making sense. But you talked about had kind of having agency as a storyteller and how you learned opening up for Nicole that you had that inside of you. But with this, you're sort of then taking everything you learned doing stand-up and then destroying it 
and relearning this new set of skills. So how has it felt to put the power into the storyteller's hands in your sort of the vessel through which they're working after which you had already learned how to tell your own story? So that must have been very difficult. You know, it 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 would have been, I mean, the, the difficulty certainly existed in, in like, like Nomo was saying, sort of the fear of like, eh, am I going to be <laughs> like, am I going to be fired? Like, is this, this is a mistake. You guys, you guys messed up. Like you could probably get like a real, but um, after that, like kind of subsided, uh, it, it really just speaks to the strength of the writing that, that someone who is an outsider was able to live in it. Um, I, I felt like Paul Lucia and Jen, our creators and our entire writing staff that, you know, they exist within LA comedy, which is like my home. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Ava, my character, that's also kind of her home. And so I see Ava's everywhere. You know, I yeah, have, of course, she felt like, very familiar to me for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. And um, so it, 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 it speaks to the strength of the character and the writing that, you know, I was able to get in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually, you know, they allowed me to write jokes for her. Um, they oh, they lived, did. Like, okay. Come over to Video Village and just mm -hmm. like pitch lines or they'd be like all right go ahead like this one's for you just like do whatever you want to put in there and they were really lovely about that with the whole cast and because everyone a lot of people are, are comedians right. um in the show so um it, it just you know I, I got lucky in that that's the project was so strong you know the material was so strong it's really like it, and do you think it's helped you sort of feeling like an outsider in this format but it helps the character because she is an outsider in Vegas, in, in this world that is completely foreign to her. Certainly, certainly. I think there are a ton of um, sort of parallels between her experience and mine and, you know, entering into this new world with, you know, Vegas runs so much uh, <laughs> differently than, than Los Angeles. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it certainly, um, there were a lot of places for me to be like, oh yeah, I get that, I get that, I get that in her. It, what's interesting too is that we, we look at the generational aspects of their dynamic and you really see that Vegas is a place where veterans and older people still have power. Like mm -hmm. here, people in their 70s and 80s still selling out crowds and, and in Hollywood, if you're in your 70s and 80s still working, I mean, it's a miracle. So it's very interesting to see that flipped where being young is actually can hurt you, you know? And I think, and I love their interplay. It's really, it's very special. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and I'd love to talk to Zasha. And needless to say, you finished a very iconic show, an iconic character a few years back. We all know what that show was, so I don't even need to say it. How challenging was it for you to leave her behind and be seen as someone who can do a lot of different things? Because I've seen you in other movies, you're, you have a lot of versatility, but of course, the business being what it is, we put people in little boxes. How did the character and flight attendant speak to you as something that showed another dimension of what you could do? Um. Well, to answer the first part of your question, um, I would say it was like nearly impossible um, and still a process. I'm always sort of, it's so funny, like especially growing up in this and like seeing it from the other side. I'm so fascinated by, I'm, which I'm sure like every woman on this Zoom has experienced as well. Like, you know, the literal definition of our job is that we play different people for a living, you know, like Angela Bassett playing Tina Turner, you know? Um, right. And yet I'm still so constantly in awe of the fact that everybody who is supposed to be open-minded to the fact that we, that this is not us, this is us playing a different character is like, yeah, no, but I saw her in that other thing. And so like, she can't do a serious role because she's funny. And it's like, but your literal job is to <laughs> open your mind and be like, right, she's now auditioning for something different because that's the definition of an actor. Right. <laughs> but like, it's, you know, do I you think, think, do you think women have a harder time getting over that than, than men? Yes. 1,050%. Okay. That would like, be my no, guess, but I hands want, down, I no question. I mean, honestly, you know, I loved every single male character. Every single man that was on Girls was an angel and a genius, and we all adored them. But we would all also bitch and moan about the fact that, like, every guy on Girls, like, we were four female leads. They were all getting straight offers while we were still auditioning. 
And like to, into season six, after we had been like nominated for Golden Globes and won them. And like, I think it's just, I don't know. Yeah. I think there's a very, I'm not sure uh, to this day, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Like I've thought a lot about this and had a trouble like distilling it to an answer of like, what is it about our industry that allots the space for men to play something exceptionally specific and then open the door for them to be like, come play something to like, you know, play Hamlet and then go do a slapstick comedy. Whereas like if a woman were to do that, I don't know why it just seems to be like a, a steeper climb for us. But um, I mean, I was, I fucking love my job so much. I loved playing that character. It was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, uh, it is, it has been really fascinating. It's been like almost an anthropological study. Like I'll even <laughs> go, I'll go meet, like have general meetings with people and they're like, like I'll walk it. Like, I'm, I don't know. Like I call people dude. Like I'm, I have tattoos all over my body. I'm like so different from that character. Yeah. And they're almost, I often find the reaction to like me, Zasha is often like confusion. <laughs> Right. And because people so deeply identify me with that part, even though they know that obviously it was a television series. And so um, Do you I think had, it's yeah. harder too when for people who get into the business and have an iconic character so early in their career. I think that maybe it's also sure. so difficult because then that just gives you even more years that you have to prove yourself beyond that, that iconic moment. Yeah. I think and I, and I agree. I think it's, it's, and, and I always wonder, is it, Obviously the team, everyone's teams, there's something in that, but it's also the casting process too. I find where is this falling apart, right? Where are the casting directors and people watching you read or watching you audition? What, what are they missing in this process? And I, I don't have an answer to that. I'm always just stymied by it. Well, to me, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm also, I don't have any of the answers, but <laughs> what I've found throughout my career, the thing that speaks uh, truest to me is that I think it all just comes down to fear. You know, like we essentially when someone's casting something, they have a, they have a, a problem. And the problem is they have to find someone to fit into a certain role. And, a, you know, an entire cast is like a puzzle piece and you need everything mm -hmm. to fit. And we're coming in and asking someone to have faith that we can do the job to the best ability possible. And especially when it's in television, it's like throughout potentially a number of seasons. It's a huge commitment for everybody. It's a huge yeah. commitment and it's a ton of money on the line. Mm -hmm. And so if we come in and we're not the solution to the problem that they had, that they thought we would be, that's an epic mistake. Mm -hmm. So I think there's this weird disconnect that happens where like, what it really should be is like a gut reaction and a feeling like it should be someone us coming in and doing something. And if someone responds to us as that character, hmm. that's the answer. And yet then this like, this like coloring of fear comes in, which is like, okay, well, but like, is she the perfect answer? Is she the right answer? And like, but I saw her do this other thing. So like, I don't know, she did that once in the audition, but like, can she sustain that for six <laughs> seasons? And all of these questions start to right. swirl in what should be a creative conversation. And it suddenly becomes one about business. Right. Um, and I, I remember, I remember being at Sundance a few years ago and I was at the premiere of Wiener Dog, that very strange oh, movie, yeah. the Todd Solondz movie that you're in, which was a very strange movie and I'll never understand it. But it was so fun <laughs> to see you in such a strange kind of artistic free flowing arena because then I, saw, I was like oh this is this is her like really having fun you could I could see you kind of setting yourself free from the confines of this tv character and I couldn't wait to see what else you were going to do because it was it was that kind of first step out right I think it was before yeah. girls had wrapped but it was fun to see that oh okay she's taking this was her choice this was her choice to do this movie right your team wasn't saying go do this weird indie that will make no money right <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they, they, yeah. I mean, they were fine with it, but I don't think sure. they were like, they weren't like going on vacation because of it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think like, I'm sure so many people here have experienced, like for me, it was one of the things that I was so excited about with flight attendant is like, uh, you know, Kaylee and Steve Yaki and uh, Susanna, like they all 
saw that I was capable of doing something else. And they like, I mean, for it's sort of a cliche term, but like they took a chance on me and they were like, oh, no, she could do this. And then they allotted me the space to go do something different because it was still I was like, this is still comedy. Like she's yeah. still a comedic character. She's just super fucking dry. <laughs> and so she's really different. And right. I think that that's all it is. I think it's like a, having all of these creators, these human beings give us the space to do what we do for a living and not keep us in the box of like, oh, well, that's what they did previously. So we just want to see them do that again. Right. And that's a great criterion for who you work with, right? Do you want me to, do you want to see me in the box or are you going to let me get out of the box? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I love that. That's a really great insight. And Kristen, I'd love to talk about your work in Made for Love, which I think now you have this two-part, what I'm calling dystopian desert love series after Palm Springs. <laughs> I remember seeing the key art and I'm like, oh, poor thing is hot again. And she's running from stuff and she's in this weird, like, I don't know what's going on, wormhole-ish situation. But it's really excellent work and so compelling. And getting back to the story you told earlier about physicality, I think you have such a special sense of physicality because I can tell you're a theater performer, super comfortable on stage. And I'd love to talk about what have you pulled from that training into working in TV and film that you feel helps you? But then what are some of the things that also Noma was talking about, like adjusting that training for your work in something like Made for Love? I don't know. Uh, I think like maybe what... I've taken from it is that like uh, the thing that I love more than anything is acting with actors. Mm. Like that's what I love. That's what I miss a lot about about plays is that you you're with you're like in the flow with a group of people and you've made something to get it together and you've created a world and you know sort of what so what Noma was talking about earlier is that like you know one night you'll feel like you're literally like touching an electric life current as a group and as an individual and that something is like flowing through you that is bigger than any of you individually and it's 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 incredible it is like it's like a high and the next night half the audience is asleep and you don't understand <laughs> you're there like burying your soul and using every molecule and memory and everything that's ever happened to you to like tell this story and someone's on their phone and it makes you want to like rip your eyes out <laughs> and and it goes and it goes like that and it's and it's exactly what Noma said it's like humbling it's a, a constant like humbling and so I would say that uh maybe I've brought that in which is that like I think I'm still adjusting to uh I wish there were a world in which but this is just not how things are made they, they could just like set up a bunch of cameras and we could just do the scene a thousand times and not mm. like I'm still sometimes I have to wrap my brain around like, oh, right, we're here and then we're there and then we're in that time of like resetting and losing the flow and then having to start yeah, over. Like, I just want to be with whoever I'm in the scene with and be trying a million different things. I also don't, uh, I'm, I think I still get used to how fast you have to go mm. to like, I mm. really like to like sit in something and I really like to like experiment with it. Um, I would say the, I don't know if I, I would say any of it, not that you phrased it, you didn't say like, and what has hurt mm. you? No, no, just something that you've maybe had to adjust and maybe finesse to fit the format. I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but like, and I'm sure everyone here has, an, uh, uh, like, again, to what Noma said, like, I am constantly chasing a high that, like, I got early on in plays, which is where you feel like the pulse. Yeah. You're in the pulse. To quote Fiona Apple, you're like back in the pulse and you're with the pulse <laughs> together and you're in the pulse with the people in the audience and everyone, um, it is like a holy communion and everything gets lifted and everyone's given space and mm -hmm. everyone is like communing together. And I've had that happen on uh, film and TV sets, but I don't, I don't think I'm aware of it in the same way or something. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I get, I'm like always searching for that. And then sometimes I'll see a finished product and I'll be like, oh, it was there. And I didn't know, mm. or I'll feel it in the scene and then I'll watch it and I'll be like, oh, they didn't choose that one. So, <laughs> like, you know, like, right. I also miss the, um, that you edit as a group. Like you're each other's editors. And, and I, do, I do sometimes like the, the idea of like giving something that we've all worked so hard on over to, um, you know, 
people, uh, uh, maybe like a lot of cooks in a kitchen is very uh, mm. scary still. And I don't, but I, but I don't know like what else there is to do other than like, you know, go in and just like leave it all there and what else can you do? But I don't know if that answered your question, but that's where my No, no, I, well, I think it's, <laughs> if I'm understanding you, it's adjusting the expectation for that alchemy that you experience on stage. Ultimately, you have more control over that than you do the final product when you yeah. have editors and post and all this stuff can change in the end and it's really out of your control. And I think that's probably a difficult thing to, to yeah. understand. Right. And like, the, yeah. And I, so I think that maybe sometimes that's like a, an adjustment, like even going out mm -hmm. of order, like the whole way, way that it works is insane to me, even though I it's completely crazy. understand it from like a logic standpoint, like we're only going to be on this bus one time. So we have to like get all the stuff that's on the bus. I like really get it very much, <laughs> but like, right. I don't know. I do sometimes I feel like, um, I am always like searching for that. And I think every actor is or else we wouldn't put up with this industry. <laughs> and like, yeah. You right. know, I'm gonna right. make up Kristen's ass though, but, but babe. What'd you say? I'm gonna blow smoke up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was being with you and watching with you. And I think, Stacey, what you were saying, what was different to the form, I, I feel that Kristen understands the form very, very well. Oh, There's something you. innate in <laughs> him, which I think the theatre world has also added to that layer of hers. But watching her, and season one, luckily enough, when you're watching season, I'm not in, but I'm around to watch when we're filming Made for Love, was just joyous. You and Billy playing beautifully, absolutely so good. Beautifully. I wish I'd seen the stuff with you and Ray, because watching that, for me, I was like... <gasps> <laughs> yeah. emotional stuff and your listening is extraordinary and I think for me that's what I get for all these actors and forgive me blow smoke up your ass Julianne your <laughs> listening is just fucking extraordinary <laughs> I think we all have that and we're all trying to like you say who's the other actor who's the other player I love watching you I love watching because I don't see process I see your character that's what I'm saying mm. oh. That's high I, praise, high praise, Kristen. I can't even, you know what, it's one of the, the most frustrating things about Made for Love, and I don't mean to like lead with that, but Onoma and I really only had one scene together. Yeah. And I our cast is like, we have like an embarrassment of riches. Like it is a group of actors that every day I wake up and I'm like, yes. Joy. <laughs> yes, we get to act together. But I was also like, just like churning over the fact that we really only had this like one thing in the van because mm -hmm. it was like, the minute we locked eyes, I know, it, and the minute we locked eyes, it was like, it was like, whoosh, it was like, <laughs> like that pulse. It's like, but boy, we all have that. Like we all like just show up with everything. And um, anyway, I love that. And thank you. Nova, and I, for saying that, and I feel the same way about you. And I, I'm so fucking determined that we're going to be in more than just- I know, we're going to do it. <laughs> but I, also, I have to say that energy that you've just described is very palpable to the viewer. In, and you may not know how you're spending it or if you're spending yeah. it properly on screen, but we can tell, just so you know, it, it yeah. really is very evident when that synergy exists in a cast. And that's really what all, every show here has that. Yeah. So I think it, you may in the moment not necessarily know like, oh, did, is that the one? Is that, but either yeah. the editors or geniuses or the casting people, it's, it's a combo, but it really shows. And I'm, speaking yeah. of which, Mare of Easttown, another example of this incredible alchemy among a cast. I mean, I'm not going to spoil the finale because I think Kristen said she hasn't finished. But oh my God, I'm um, going to away and I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but it's suffice to say, your character Lori figures prominently into the final trajectory of this oh incredible God. mystery. No, 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 I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> All I'm saying is she figures into it, and in, that can mean anything, by the way. Yeah, but and, also get ready because it's so intense. It's I so amazing. I can, tell, it's I, can so tell, I can tell. I can tell. But I'm in it's, for it. Yeah. It's a. It's not a like binging. It's sort of a set aside. You know, close the shades, yeah. turn off your phone type thing. Yeah. And Julian, as a storyteller yourself, how much, first of all, did you know about the final end? And how much did you know about the entire twist and turn aspect of the story from the beginning? And if you didn't know the ending, how were you discovering the story along the way? And then how did those discoveries inform your character? Because I always wonder if you have this sort of murder mystery, the whodunit ending, and knowing that at the top, how does that affect leading us down the path? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I'll be able to remember a couple of those questions. To <laughs> um, uh, so I, Kate, Kate, I've known Kate Winslet for a long time. Our, my husband is good friends with her ex-husband. And so I've known her for many, many years. And she, I hadn't seen her for a long time though. And she just called and said, I'm doing the show and there's the role of my best friend. And I, I, you have to do it. And I was sent the first six episodes and I thought, 
It's a great show. I love this show. Um, but I don't know if there's enough there, quite honestly. It takes me away from my family. Like, mm. um, and they just also, please just trust us, trust us, trust us. There'll be enough in seven. You'll be so happy you did it. And so I agreed to do the job after reading the first six. And then I, I saw the seventh episode before we started filming and we talked a lot about it. Um, but, you know, even on the page, I can't remember who said it about how you, I maybe Noma, like you just still, you don't really know. You can film the scene. Oh, for the undoing. Yes. You said like you film it, but you don't know how people, you, like I've been completely bowled over by how people have responded to this show and um, to Laurie Ross. And it's, um, yeah, that's like three of the questions, right? <laughs> I guess then then, and I guess for the undoing if this holds true is, is sort of when there's this big payoff at the end, the sort of murder mystery format, how are, how are you, I guess, ingraining subtlety into your performance? Because you know the secret, right? And you yes. don't want to give anything away to us. So how, an how, are, yeah, how are you modulating all of that in your performance? So I, th I'm a firm believer in like, you can, your character can have secrets, but, but when we have secrets in life, all we're trying to do is hide them, mm. right? So you don't have to indicate them as an actor, I don't think. I can let the writer and the director and the editor sort of get what they need from the performance, but I actually, I don't want to show anything. If I have a secret, I don't want you to know it. <laughs> and so that for me is kind of fun to play with mm -hmm. in terms of like building up to something and not want, knowing something, but not wanting to give it away. Mm. Well, that's probably why it was so great because and again, not spoiling anything. We don't know anything until those final moments. Uh, I mean, you're asking yourself every five seconds, like, wait, could it be her? Could it be him? Could it be? I mean, it's, that's what the, it's just an I incredible the, journey. I felt the same way when I was reading the scripts. I thought, you know, every episode I was like, oh, I know who did it. And then even when I was reading, well, yeah, I, I, I can't say. But, um, <laughs> I, I was surprised about that. No, <laughs> hey, hey. it's fine. You'll find out. It's all good. I also want to say I grew up around there. So you're. Oh, you did? Yeah. Like I, the accent, you know, like I, I'd heard specifically from my family too. They were like, they, because everyone in my family sounds like that. I and love that so accent. Well done. Like the first episode, I was like, rah, rah, rah. like it was like being <laughs> back. And like it was like being like, every elementary school teacher I had sounded like that. <laughs> every, the accents, it, it was so good. So good. Okay. It's it a very specific place. Yeah. And I think that's why the show was so compelling. It was a place, and I'd seen some of the writers of their work um, out of the furnace, et cetera. And he tends to write about that world. But I think that's what, and this is a lesson Hollywood can learn. Let's set shows outside of New York and LA. Things, mm. beautiful things can happen when we get to see different communities and accents and different faces and actors who look like townies. That's what was so special about that cast where I'm like, how is this person not a real guy at a convenience store? He just <laughs> looks like a guy who works at it. I mean, and that's how magical all those actors were. It was very stunning work. So thank you so much. And Kristen, thank tell you. us what you think about the finale. <laughs> it's so stressful. And then finally, and of course not lastly, Ruche, I may destroy you and no offense to the other shows here, but it's now nestled deep, deep, deep inside. It has made me question everything I've ever thought about sexuality, consent, blame all of the feelings that have come up for especially women watching this, but also men. There's an incredible storyline talking about men and consent and assault. And it's really just, I'm actually just getting, getting chills thinking about it. So thank you for, first of all, for telling the story. And your character, Terry, bless her. She does bring levity to this, to this difficult storyline. And she's also an actor. She's trying so mm -hmm. hard to, to do her craft. And I would love to know what of her experiences in the show did you most relate to? And did you bring any personal experiences into the show? Um, I would say yes and yes. So <laughs> there was this, I think about one or two years of my career where I was a commercial queen. So I was like doing, I think there was the most I ever had was like five commercial castings in one day. Whoa. And it was like this place and that place and this place. And I really, I hated them, but I loved them at the same time because you could just pump them out. Do you know what I mean? There isn't like a whole character Bible where you sit down and study what right. the woman in the supermarket's <laughs> thinking before you buy the bar of chocolate. And they're really just casting uh, you on your looks anyway, probably, right? Do I, I am mean, I the right, you know? 
sometimes I, I have no idea what they did, but I think what I always used to do in commercial castings, um, I would literally just go in there and act a fool. Like <laughs> a complete fool. Because you're asked to do stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. Like <laughs> the most bizarre things. And I think what I enjoyed about it was the fact that I would go in there and play, completely play and leave and be like, yeah, nothing happened in there. Only those guys know until I get cast and then I'll do the stupid thing on TV. And I have people send me videos. Is this you doing a stupid dance in the V&Q advert? And I'm like, yeah, but um, for Terry, um, I very much knew the commercial world and it was actually quite funny. So there is the scene where um, she goes in for a casting where um, it's about all women and, you know, being really inclusive and whatever. And I remember, a couple of days before that scene, Michaela called me and she was like, you've done loads of casting auditions. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, what does it look like in the room? And I was like, okay, well, there are the people filming it. There's a screen, there's always a coffee table and a couch. And then you're standing on the X. And it's literally the same in every single casting room that I've been to for commercials. And so she was like, okay, cool. And then came to the day to film that scene and I walked into the casting room and I actually freaked out for a second because it felt like I had just gone <laughs> into an actual commercial casting. <laughs> and there wasn't much acting in that scene. It was just me going to a commercial casting because it was very, very, very visceral. So I was able to draw from my own experience um, from that and yeah, so that's what we see in Terry, because I have been in that in that world before. And I think one of the last scenes where we watch Terry's commercial on TV and it's kind of like this win for her. I know about that as well, because in my commercial queen year, I wasn't really getting any other work. So it was like every commercial was a win and I'd sit and watch it with my family and we all cheer. <laughs> what was your favorite? What was your favorite that you were able to get on the air? Um, my favorite commercial actually never aired. <gasps> Oh no. Yeah, but I got paid for it. <laughs> and it was in um, Portugal. I got to fly out to Portugal. It was an American commercial actually. And it was this huge, it was like my first entry into like what Hollywood would be like. There were hundreds of people. It was like in the, in the heat and there was this guy dressed up as a superhero and he was like sweating so much. And I was, we were on top of a bus because it was like a superhero scene. And for some reason I lost my my, I couldn't remember my lines. And I remember someone holding up dummy sides. <laughs> like these huge... <laughs> I mean, it never came up, which I'm glad it didn't, but I got paid for it. So um, I'm, I'm not mad. <laughs> hey, that paycheck is sometimes all you need, right? <laughs> it was. <laughs> well, thank you for that story. And I just want to pose one final question to everyone, which is, as we all sort of try to climb back into normalcy, whatever that looks like for each of us in the next few months, is there anything you can think about from the last year that you actually can say, you know, I'm proud of myself for doing that amidst a really hard situation work-wise, juggling family, juggling work. Is there something about who you are as an artist that you can sort of allow yourself just a moment of, oh, you know, this was tough, but I've sort of, I've been able to maintain this thing that I love doing. Does anything come to mind? Do you mean during the pandemic? Yeah, or just now as we sort oh, yeah. of as we kind of reflect on surviving this year, but also what we were able to accomplish despite the difficulties. I was grateful for those few months. I was so grateful to be at home. And I'm very touch the word, um, these last few years is it's been a blessing of work, but there was a moment I realized I'm not catching up with my child. And mm -hmm. so when we shut down, made for love on March the 13th straight home to New York to see my kid. And then my mum back out to England um, uh, on the Thursday. And if she'd waited a few more days, she wouldn't have been able to go. Oh, wow. And therefore it was just me and the kid. And I, uh, I got to know her. I, it's not, it's, it's that thing of going, oh, this is life again. Cause that, that, that cliche of going, we all need to be in the world to be able yeah. to represent the world. There was something humbling about meeting people, talking to people, there's experiences around that time, which I really loved. I don't know whether that's answering the question, but I yeah, loved sure. that space and I loved 
to get to know my kid, who's now 10, 14. And I joke and say, thank God we liked each other. Yes, <laughs> we actually liked each other. <laughs> it's me. It was wonderful. Um, I love that. So coming into the world, having had that time, I'm now, yes, please. What else? What else? What else? Yeah. Right. How about you, Hannah? Were, were you allowing yourself time to rest and reflect and write or just kind of catch up on sleep? You know, what did you do to take care of yourself? Yeah, I think it it was an eye-opening time period for me. I kind of realized that like maybe our collective conception of like how things run and what matters and the pace keeping up with everything going on and having to, you know, I, I, I think before the pandemic, my art form became my work and I was in all honesty having trouble loving it. Um, Mm -hmm. because I was kind of like, I got to go on the road because that's the only way I'm going to make money. And so I got to like really pump out this material, but I'm actually incapable of doing that and being proud of it. I just write slowly. Hmm. Um, And so I felt like writer's block for probably like eight to nine months before the pandemic. And literally on March 13th, I was like, (laughs) <laughs> like literally it was so insane because all wow. of the, the external pressure faded away and the floodgates opened creatively mm. and I I take that with me going forward I mean I am privileged beyond all belief to have had this job and to have this work um, work where my self-worth has to come from within as opposed to like doing stand-up mm-hmm. where like I hand myself over each night and whether or not a group of strangers likes me you know crushes me like I'm just like right. let's alter this you know this feedback loop like disrupt mm-hmm. that it's been a lot of a lot of that and I hope to keep going forward you know taking my time and and knowing that you know we do live in a a bit of a different world today where, you know, we have a long way to go, I think, in terms of, you know, um, the work that we get as non-cis male people. Uh, But, you know, I I think that uh, we are, we we can sort of take a little bit more time and Mm. do the things that speak to us, you know, that that's not not doing anything out of a, a, a dire need, really allowing the art to remain pure. Um, Mm. and the work to remain pure and to come from within. I love that. Bringing it back to the basics. (laughs) And how about you, Zasha? Have you worked on any new projects or discovered any new passions in this last year? Um, I I wouldn't say new passions. Um, I've been a horseback rider since I was little. Um, And so that was like a real a blessing for me because we ride outside. I I got to keep riding throughout Mm -hmm. the pandemic and, and we live upstate. And so um, I basically spent every day at the barn riding my horse, which was a total joy. And I realized how lucky I was um, to do that. But, um, you know, we, we, we butt up on like a hundred acres of woods and, um, I think, you know, sort of echoing a bit uh, what Noma and Hannah said, but, uh, you know, like I, like I said, like I grew up in this industry and, and I, so I was surrounded from day one by this, I feel like we're sort of fed this myth as creatives that like, if you don't run as fast as you can on the hamster wheel at all times, that um, you're going to be forgotten mm-hmm. or like something will go wrong or like someone else will get the thing that you could have had if you weren't just like always standing in front of the door waiting. And like, even if you're having success and theme, theme, like things are going well, like you still have to be hustling and you just have to hustle harder and longer and faster and like sleep less. And, um, <laughs> right. and I, and I think um, it's just, I feel like the pandemic, like the quarantine and the fact that the entire, you know, my husband and I talked about this a lot because he's also an actor, like never in our lives would we have had that type of full stop halt. You know, I, our industry shuts down for Christmas, but I feel like it's never actually real. Like we're still like, okay, well, we're waiting for something. We're waiting to hear about something that we was casting before and it's going to 
you know, well, here on January 2nd. Um, (laughs) And the fact that the entire world stopped and we were all forced to look at the fact that like everything stopped and we were still alive and we were Mm. still actors and there would still be work to come, but that there was nothing that we could do. It made me really reevaluate how fast I make myself run and like the pace at which I make myself hustle and how much of it is like hustling for hustling sake. Mm. And that we don't, it's like, there's only so much of yourself you can give that will actually have an effect. And that so much of, I like, I had always said before, but I feel like I'd missed half of it that like, um, you know, you as an actor is you as a human and vice versa. Like, and I think sometimes we separate those things. And so we don't give ourselves what we need as human beings. And we don't like what Noma was saying about like time with her child or like time with yourself or enough sleep or self care. Like, I know that sounds kind of cliche, but, um, I think at least for me, it really forced me to reevaluate and look at like, Oh, the amount at which I am enjoying my life and my life as a human being is rich and fulfilling and being taken care of and like being fostered and cultivated and looked at like that will inevitably intrinsically affect my craft and like how well I do at it. And hopefully like uh, the doors that open to me Mm -hmm. and that I don't have to be like, that I can take back a lot of the percentage of what I'm giving to the hustle that like, it's not actually necessary. Um, And I feel like that like full shutdown was actually what needed to happen to like jar that in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it happened to a lot of creative people where they were like, Oh my God, I'm giving so much of myself unnecessarily. Um, And I can like, yeah, I can sort of, I can take it back. And like that. that that's helped me a, a lot. I love that. That's an amazing lesson and a painful way to learn it, but yeah, but sure. It totally. Right. No, it's, it's invaluable. And I, I agree too. And does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Those are all very wonderful insights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I would, just, I would piggyback on all that, but I yeah. think that like, uh, sometimes I wonder this certainly within our industry, but like just as a capitalist society at large, like what are we all running toward? Like what is, this isn't gonna keep us from dying. This isn't gonna keep us from grief. This isn't gonna keep us from loss. It's not gonna keep us from love. It's not gonna keep like, I think there was also like a real, um, and I missed people so much, you know, in the beginning. And actually like, as we slowly be able, we're able to see each other sort of like outside or, and then now thankfully like vaccinated inside. I was like, how for so long could I have thought that a walk with a friend was something to fill the time and not mm. actually like the whole point? Right. Why did I think that that was a way to be like, well, I'm not working that day. So like, we'll go for a walk. That's, it's, it's like, what right. was I doing? This was the whole thing. This walk right. was the whole thing. Right. And I'd say that was like a, a, a big shift. It's beautiful. Yeah. Walk is the thing. I love that. That's a good t-shirt. Yeah, walk slogan. is the thing. <laughs> yeah. And Juliana Ruche, I don't want to rush anybody. If anyone wants to add anything. Um, I had an interesting lockdown experience because I May Destroy You came out in June. Oh my God. So, um, kind of like destroyed all of us at the yeah. same time. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, so I think the first few weeks of lockdown, I had an absolute ball because my mom was stuck with me as well. Oh, wow. So I had a lot of good food. I fell in love with reality TV. I have no <laughs> shame in saying that. And I got a lot of ice cream. So I think for me, it was such a blessing because it's like, you know, the pace at which life is going, like everyone has said, is always go, go, go. So I had a moment to actually sit and enjoy probably what might be the last time I'll have time to do nothing with my mom. And I mean, not that she's going anywhere, but you know what I mean? This is the way life sure. is going. Sure. And everyone's in different countries and whatever. So it was nice to be stuck um together and we had so much fun and got to know her even more and it was brilliant mm-hmm. and then um about april came in and then pr started but i may destroy you so i spent a lot of time with my laptop 
doing this exact thing. Right? thing. Um, so it was quite interesting. And for me, it was like my first like real, this, I made a story could be one of my biggest roles so far. And so this is like a completely different world for me. And so it was so interesting to, you know, have like the press um, junkets and having like sitting in front of my computer for like six hours. Okay, not six hours. I <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It was just like, you know, movement. So as much as everything was still, things were still kind of moving, but I'm really glad that it happened the way it did. It was almost like a smooth entry for me into like bigger things, but I did really enjoy the time. And like everyone has said, I have now realized what's more important. Like Sosha said, no matter how much hustle you hustle, it, do you know what I mean? You can't physically do anything. I mean, no matter how money you have no like it's like it was a complete leveler for me and so moving forward in life I always just have to like take a moment and remember that you know I can't kill myself for this like there's more to life than our work mm. it's hard to say that as an actor because it's all we do <laughs> but, um, yeah right. I just had to right. reprocess my mind and reprogram it to think that you know this is not be all end all there is life there is hope and that's what that's the most important thing well, what a perfect sentiment to close this conversation with. Thank you all of us. Thank you all of us. Thanks to all of you for being here. Actually, thanks to me too for being here. <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah. honestly, this has been so pleasant. And after 50 virtual events, this has been really like a beautiful bomb to, to everything. So thank okay. you so much for your work and congratulations and hope the Emmy voters take notice of all your amazing contributions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Take care.